Hello, my name is Daniel Fox. I'm 25 years old and I was born in Watford, North West London to Quentin and Anne Fox. I'm the proud youngest grandson to my lovely grandmother sitting opposite me here. Her name is Helen. She was born in Pabianice in Poland. She's 89 years old uh, and she's the most inspirational figure in my life. So Granny, if I may, I'd like to start by taking you back to your childhood. Can you tell me a little bit about where you were born? Yes, certainly. Well, um, my name, my maiden name was Helena Chmura and I was born in Pawianice, Poland. It's a small town, 60,000 inhabitants, uh, out of which 10% were Jewish. And in the, the nearest big town was called Łódź, a very big industrial town where the population of Jews was second after Warsaw. And Łódź was very, very well known as uh, was called the Smoke Manchester for his textile factories. And uh, my father <coughs> worked in Łódź. In my household, I was the youngest one, plus my brother Henry and my sister Marilla. They were much older than I was. They were already in high school. I <coughs> attended school in Pabianice, and when the war broke out, 1939, I was 12 years old. My um, childhood was very happy. Um, I was quite a good pupil in school. I wasn't, actually, my school was Jewish, and the teachers were Jewish, and was called uh, Mr. Kleinman, who was actually the, the head of the school. Uh, the hours were from like eight till two, two o'clock the school was finished, we used to go home, have our main meal, and in the afternoon I still attended school, either helping with library, or we also had a scheme to help smaller children and children from the private families who used to come in the afternoon to school, where we gave them um, food, uh, sandwiches and cocoa, and also helped them with their school. And uh, I had a lot of friends. I used to belong to an organization called Hanoar Hatsioni, which was um, sort of similar to <laughs> scouts in, in England. And uh, Poland had a very strong and severe winter, so during the winter time, we used to go skating, and life was idyllic for a youngster, for a teenager. So let's talk a little bit about your father now. Um, I understand he had a very important role in the community. What can you tell me about him? Oh yes, my father was very well known in Pabianice. He was the chairman of the Zionist organization, mm -hmm. Pabianice, and also belonged to the Judenrat and to various patronages and uh, everyone, all the Jewish community knew my father. And I was a very proud daughter when I used to walk with him and he was greeted by everybody. And he's, he was dreaming that one day uh, Palestine will become mm. a, a Jewish nation. And he was trying very hard to, to help people to understand how important that mm. is. Was he known by the non-Jews as well as the Jews oh, in yes, the community? Oh yes, 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 he did. And uh, my sister, as I mentioned, she was already in high school, in sort of gymnasium. Mm. Uh, but she uh, suffered a lot of anti-Semitism because the school was predominantly a um, Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And there were a quota was for Jewish girls, like for 600 Catholic girls and four only Jewish yeah. girls. And she was suffering quite a lot verbally and otherwise. And she made up her mind that she definitely w would wants to leave Poland and go to Palestine. Mm. Well, my parents didn't want to hear about it because she was only 17. But she had hunger strikes and, and various other things at home. Mm. And eventually uh, they decided that maybe she should go 
and she eventually left in 1937 to go to an agronomical school mm. for girls in Israel. The school is called Nahalal. What age were you at the time? And she left? I was 10 at the time. And of course, we were, everyone was extremely sad mm. um, to, to see her go, but she was determined to do that. And the next time I saw her was, of course, after the war. Right. Yeah. So you touched a little bit on the on a sort of anti-Semitic feeling at, yes. at her school. Yeah. Was that was that sort of pervasive throughout the community at different levels? Well, I, I mean, Could you sense personally, in personally, me, I, I didn't because I had uh, mixed friends, hmm. Catholic and Jewish. And you went to a Jewish. School. And I went to a Jewish school, so I really. At that point, I didn't sort of see it or, mm. or feel very much. Right. And uh, we were Jewish, of course, but not very sort of religious. We used to go to uh, synagogue for Jewish holidays, but my father worked on a Saturday. And uh, my uh, main language was Polish. I never learned Yiddish. And um, I can't say that I sort of Hmm. Had uh, any any problems with regards to anti-Semitism so the Jewish at and that age? Non-Jewish communities yes. rub, rubbed along quite yes. well. And yes, yes, yeah. Apart and from a few but my friends, my my parents, their friends were mainly Jewish. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've touched on whether you could feel any anti-Semitism in the community. Yes. Given your age, it's probably unlikely that you were able to sort of detect it. So in your little bubble of going to a Jewish school. Yeah. But your sister felt it yes. and she moved away yes, yes. maybe because of it so there was something going on don't you think oh yes yes and also i remember at that time a cousin of mine was in at university in mm. warsaw studying engineering and it was the time when all the jewish um people had were told to sit separately uh mm. in, at the classroom at uni and that was again started showing that the anti-Semitism mm. was ripe. And he also actually went to Palestine at that time. Oh really? Yes. Wow. So the yeah. first sort of signs of yeah. segregation yeah. there, really. Yeah, yeah. And so when, when the war started, describe what that was like when the, when the Germans just arrived in your town. You didn't have any, any forewarning of it, did you? No. We had no warning at all. On the contrary, uh, uh, as a pupil, uh, learning about history of Poland, uh, the propaganda was as such that um, should the German even think of invading Poland, we are not giving them even a button. Mm. And of course, being a child, you learn all these things and you believe in it. And then, 3rd of September 1939, the German, German army entered Pabianice. There was no fighting. Nobody fought with anybody. The Polish army as such was in disarray. They came back from various fronts with horses, with very primitive. And suddenly I was looking with Eve of all these motorized army, beautiful men, beautifully Tired, mm. loveless, and I thought to myself, "Is this? Are these the people who had nothing to eat?" Yeah. The Polish government ran away to England. There was nobody there. Nobody cared. And then, soon after that, we've realized that the war is starting with the Jews, mm. because straight away the people were especially the religious Jews with beards, were taken at random, the beards cut. There were just humiliation everywhere. The synagogues were burned. And we've realized that we are the people that are at war, right. not, the, not the Polish Christian population. So quickly it escalated. Very, very quickly. And, and then worse. very few weeks later, we started to wear, we were told to wear the yellow star mm -hmm. with the name Yuda, which is Jew, so that we are easily recognized. 
And of course, v various, various regulations appear in the street, what you mustn't do, what you yeah. should do. But we still lived in our own home and in our own place and had sort of the idea of food was still easily obtained. So Russia had by that point. No, not yet. And we have heard some rumors about which ghetto, but we didn't really know exactly what is happening there. Yeah. Wasn't there an interesting, just taking you back before the ghetto uh, was established, there was an incident at your house once where a uh, German soldier came in and Well, that was already in the ghetto. That was when that we was went. When you, yeah, when. And in, 19, in 1940, a ghetto in Pavianica mm -hmm. was established, and because we didn't live in that ghetto quarter, we had to move. So we were given one room, uh, and then um, the Spera, which is uh, the curfew, mm -hmm. was introduced. And after like seven o'clock, nobody was allowed even in the ghetto to be shown in the street. The ghetto was not. Uh, there were no, no no soldiers standing outside or or like in, in Muj where there was um, wires and things. But uh, at that time, when, when in the evening, the German soldiers decided to go on rampage and just do whatever they like. So they used to go to these various houses, take what they want, terror. And I remember one of some of them, about three of them came to our place. And um, I was wearing a cardigan, which, is, which I knitted myself, and one of them decided I've got to take it off and give it to them. And my mother sort of spoke German well. She said, oh, is this necessary for German soldiers? And of course, I was, I was giving a good hiding, uh, and they took whatever they like. But children, us, we thought that this is not going to last a long time. So describe the move from your, your home, your Pabianice flat, yes. where you grew up, yes. the place that you loved, yes. to this small Yeah, well, flat it, in was, the it was very traumatic. But then we had this hope that this is, not, this is just not going to last long. The war is going to last, will finish very quickly, and everything will get back to normal. And when we moved into the ghetto, we also then received Russian cards, mm -hmm. and we had to work in various factories and, and produce goods for the German. Mm. Everyone. Because if you didn't work, you didn't have the card, and you couldn't get sure. Russian. But the Russians were not too bad. And uh, as I said, well, we were still in Pavia. Tell me more about the Russian The cards. Russian, well, what it did was you get? A, How much we, we you got get? some ersatz sort of coffee made of some corn or something. How much some each? jam, well, a few, I don't know, maybe 10 deca. It was not much. Hmm. But because the ghetto was not closed, there were a lot of Polish Christian people who could still come during the day. For instance, our maid, hmm. who was Christian, hmm. used to come and bring us a lot of food ah, from right. the... So she smuggled it in? Yes, yeah, smuggled it in because it wasn't closed, the ghetto, hmm. you see? So it was still easy, easier to get some food and things. Was that illegal for her to do that? Uh, well, probably not. Was she got found out? Was she being Yeah, probably was not illegal, but I mean, okay. people did it. And uh, as I said, we, we used to gather, we used to talk, we used to have meetings, talk about Israel. My father taught me German letters and German writings and things. And we sort of hope that this is just not going to take long, mm. the whole thing. And then, unfortunately, my father was arrested yeah. together with two other people who were in the prominent Jewish... Um, uh, Jewish figures, in, figures yes, in the community. Yes, in the community. And how did that make you feel? Well, it was... The worst thing in my life it was really terrible. And the prison that he was in prison was um, quite far away from the ghetto. 
So let's talk a bit about your father's arrest. Yes. What, what he do you was, know about that? Well, he was denounced by somebody. I don't exactly know who a it German was. Official. Yes. And he was arrested with two other people. And of course, we, we were just devastated. We didn't know what to do, how to take all this. But at that time, we could still do something with money or, or, or just bribery. And I managed to see my father through some window in the, and Prison. send some parcels to him. Right. Well, and parcels. I think he was three months yeah. in prison. And some miracle, he was released, and the two other, his friends, were sent to concentration camp. And I remember that when my father was released, the people from my town brought him on his shoulders, and wow. we were so, so happy that he's at home with us. So he must have been a much loved figure. Oh yes, yes, he was, he was, he was, absolutely. How did it feel to be the daughter of a man so Well, I we didn't loved. realize that he was <laughs> so well. <laughs> you sort of took like this for granted. Yes, exactly, for granted. And uh, he tried so much to, to help others as much as he could. Mm. And at that time, we heard already that the which notorious wood ghetto, that people are already starving there, that are uh, ill, malnutrition mm. and illnesses are rampant. And some people managed to escape to Pabianice, where the conditions were much better. Yeah. But of course, when they came, the problem was how to obtain the cards, the Russian right. cards. Right. So they used to come to my father and he tried to help them by giving them the cards which he obtained from people that were dead and in that way he could help the people. So he literally had to go around the town? Well yes, they were, they were give, yes, there were other time. people involved too who So family managed. members yes, would give it? Yes, yes, yeah. And he helped them. And uh, that state of affairs was going on till May 1942, when there were all placards all over the ghetto that the ghetto in Pavianice are being dissolved, mm -hmm. and we all have to come out from our houses, take very small rucksack with us, and stand outside the house. It was a Saturday, 12 of May, and I shall, that is well imprinted in my clearly. memory, absolutely. So um, 8,000 people came outside. We were told to come in the middle of the road, and, and eight of us. Mm -hmm. And we started to walk. We had no idea what happens next. I was holding to my brother, my mother was next to me, and my father. And the Polish Christian <coughs> population were just looking in. Nobody said anything. And we were just walking in silence, not knowing what is happening next. You had no idea where you were going? Absolutely no idea. Must it was very a very hot, very hot day, and it was on a Saturday, I remember that. And we walked maybe a couple of hours, and eventually we were headed in into a very big um, stadium, which was originally a, a football ground. Mm. And there, uh, a selection was being carried out. Um, people with categories. Category A was able to work, category B and category C. In May 1942, yes, you were moved from your 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 ghetto in yeah. Pabianice. Yeah, describe how that occurred. Yes, well, we had to come out from our houses, just take with us a very small rucksack, and were there were there German officials there with guns? Oh yes, guns and dogs and screaming, and of course the older people 
were not allowed to, yeah. couldn't do it. And my grandfather, who lived with us, unfortunately, we had to leave him behind. What do you know about what happened to him? Well, what happened to all the old people who were left behind, they were probably killed straight away. They were not suitable for work or they couldn't work. So, so they were absolutely, them. yeah. And so you were we put were out walked, the street? Yes, and, and what happened next? walked in silence. 8,000 people. Flanked by German soldiers? Yes, walked in silence. The Christian population was just watching. And eventually we arrived at this Krusha Endeplatz, which was originally a football ground, very big. And there the segregation took place. They segregate people able to work, mm -hmm. letter A. There were people, letter C, which were children up to 10 years of age, and letter B, which were old people and disabled mm -hmm. and so forth. So myself, my mother and my brother, and my father, we were in the category A, able to work. There was screaming, there was shouting, there was shooting. The place was very big. One Why didn't was know. Shooting? Well, you, you had shooting, you had, because they were trying to bring terror to all of us. So within so the football stadium there was shooting? Or yes. you could hear it in the distance? Yeah, no, I heard in the distance. Okay. Yeah. And of course, the, the parents of the children, the children were separated, were crying and screaming, give us our children, we give you everything, but so they, no were, they were put in separate categories yeah. and separated. We were standing, and then I don't know what happened, but somehow or other, our father was not with us anymore. And at that time was already, we arrived there maybe like four o'clock. We were just standing in this heat, no water, no nothing, not knowing. And about three o'clock at night, trams arrived and my group, the people with category A, mm -hmm. were all shoveled into the trams. Again, we didn't know where we're going. And we found ourselves in the notorious Wuj ghetto. Your father was without, not Without point. our father. We had no idea what happened to him or where he is. At what point did you lose him? In, in that, when we the were stadium. still yeah, in the stadium, I've lost, we've lost sort of sight of him somehow. And when we arrived to Wuj Ghetto, we were herded to a um, disused factory, or it was actually a prison, and again, we had no water, no food. People were crying, screaming. It was a terrible sight. When in the morning, the chairman of Wood Ghetto, his name was Heim Rumkowski, we were the, actually the first town to be sent to Wood Ghetto from the region. Mm -hmm. So it was, em it was empty when you got there? Sorry? Were there people there still? Well, in, 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 in Wood? In, in when you arrived? Oh yes, they were already there, okay. of course, from the lived there or I don't know. Uh, Your, they were there. Was the first yeah. to be merged from the from the, from the area, area, from the area. Yeah. So uh, he gave a talk to us and said that he's going to look after us, and the most important thing is to work, to work, and to obtain Russian cards because if you don't mm. get a card, you can't I live, and he'll do his best for us. G give me more of a background on, on Rumkowski. Rum uh, well, I, at that time, I didn't know, but I mean, as the time went by, so the, the parents of the children approached him, and he said, but Mr. Rumkowski, what happened to our children? What happened to our children? Crying, and he said, well, don't worry. Uh, I have heard uh, that my very good friends, Otto Shmura, who, whom I knew before the war, because we worked together in Wuj, various orphanages, 
volunteered to take all the children from Babianice, and I know that he will do his very best to look after them. You arrived in Woods Ghetto. Yes. And, and met a man called Chaim Rukowski. Yes, yes. Tell me about him. Yes, well, his power was absolute. His power was just like the Queen of England. And he was the chairman of Wood Ghetto, and everything was, he decided on everything what's happening there. Mm -hmm. It was like a small Jewish country, right. the Wood Ghetto. There were, in spite of these terrible conditions there, malnutrition, typhoid, illnesses, and absolutely terrible, terrible conditions to live with. Mm. In spite of all that, there were theaters, there were hairdressers, there were concerts. There was like a, there was a post office, own, own money called Rumkis. I, I had a sort of telegram sent to me on my birthday. It was absolutely unreal, the whole mm. thing. It was like a Jewish state. And his, na his power was absolute. And I must admit that he helped me and my family very much because my brother got a job. He spoke very good German. He was a liaison officer in an office which um, was offices of the, of the Jewish um, administration and German. So everything that came to the ghetto went through these offices everything that won, went out went so he had connection with German mm. employees also and because of that he had a special um, card saying that he and his family should not be deported well some German officials took that as what it said mm -hmm. but some of them just tore it and didn't take much notice right. So he was there. I was sent to orphanage, which was in a place called Marishin, which was about three kilometers, also in the ghetto. But it was a place that didn't look quite as bad as the central ghetto, mm. because it was a little bit like countryside, okay. where all the dignitaries and people that, and even Rumkowski had his sort of palace nearby. I was sent to orphanage and worked with the children there. And my mother what, was given a, a job in a sort of supermarket. The idea was that you had to somehow or other be able to supplement your diet or your ration with a little bit extra food. That was the whole idea. Food was the most important part. If you could work somewhere, where you could have a little bit extra food, then you, the chances of survival are so much greater. Yeah. So I wasn't the, the children that I looked after were nine, 11. Some of them were sixth generation German. They didn't even spoke Polish, only German. Mm -hmm. But of course, the German didn't, didn't realize, didn't, they were Jewish and they were sent there. Did you enjoy working there? I well? enjoyed working there very much. I tried these kids had to go to work very early in the morning in clogs and I went with them. We worked in a factory that manufactured um, uh, straw mattresses. They were always hungry. The kids were working at this factory yes, as well, were yes, they? Yes, the whole day. And then it's to come in the evening back to the orphanage. Very meager supper, some sort of um, soup very little like potatoes or a vegetable. And uh, I used to tell them stories and things and fairy stories, but uh, they were all connected with food, obviously, <laughs> telling them that one day, even Hansel and Gretel, when they came to this house that's supposed to be made of chocolate, it was made of bread. And you just go into this <laughs> house and you can cut bread and just eat as much as you want. I imagine that was but a popular story. But unfortunately, in 1943, they decided to close the orphanage. I was at that time in a hospital suffering with 
problems. I had of my health problems. I had boils due to the change of everything. Diet. Yes, diet and so forth. I was in hospital, but I heard that when these children were loaded on wagons, they called my name. And th that is something that is staying with me. I know it's very hard to all talk my about. life, yes. But they were, they were taken from you when you were in hospital. Yes, they were without take, your knowledge. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was in hospital. And what were yeah. these wagons? These wagons. Well, took them they away? were sent to uh, to to the Auschwitz, like all the others. But at that time, as I said, we d we really did not know what is happening there. We s we we were told the people that were going away, they were going to Germany to work. That that's what we thought. We had no idea what is happening in Auschwitz. So going back to Rimkowski. Yes. <coughs> the reason he helped out your family so much because there was a of my between yes him of my and your father. father. Yes. So yes. they were friends. Yes. From before before the war. From yes. pa pa yeah. yeah, and that was I must admit a great help and, to and me and and my mother and my brother. Absolutely, that must have saved probably yes. saved, contributed to saving absolutely, your life. Absolutely, absolutely. So and what, what, what do you, what after, did you begin to learn about Rumkowski and what did he, what things did he well, tell? Well, I'm afraid his name is not very well spoken by the people who were in Wood Ghetto or who survived, because he was a despot. He was to such extent that some people would consider him that he was a collaborator. Why do I you had think to that? make a program about his life. I was told, uh, and and. I try to say that it is not an easy task he had. And if he didn't deliver the people to be sent out, the German can do it themselves. So the Germans was no ordered him to round yeah, up people yeah. to be he taken was, away to concentration He was camps. the one that had to deliver, and he had to um, Maybe, I don't know whether he could do it differently, it is extremely difficult to blame people, and it was unusual circumstances. Nobody can understand the circumstances mm. Mm. when every day brought something else, and it was a survival from day to day. Life did, in a way, carry on as yes, normal. Yes, life in the did ghetto. carry on in you a had way. A birthday. And then I celebrated my birthday. Yeah. I had a telegram sent to me, and there was a party. And a Very cake, nice. and a cake, yes, a cake was made of uh, potato peel, some potato peel, some ersatz coffee, and um, I had few friends at home, and uh, I was given a present by my brother. Which you've got in your which hands. Which I've got in my hands, and it is actually a powder compact made in ghetto. Show me. Yes, of Hansel and Gretel in Polish, called wow. Jasi Małgosia, with a dedication of to me from my brother in Polish. It says, "Dear Helen, day of of your birthday, from brother, Litzmannstadt Ghetto, 24/4, 1944." And this is most prized possession in my life. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> that I'm keeping that, absolutely. So it yeah. shows that people tried to carry on as normal and tried to yes, live a normal life. Yes, I normal guess to life. To stay human, really, wasn't it? It was, and, well, we just, from day to day. Mm. And then, 1944, again, placards all over the ghetto, which ghetto, um, that ghettos being liquidated and everybody, everybody has to come to this point which was uh, actually this used um, place, in Street Charnitska yeah. it was called, mm -hmm. and where the wagons were taken, people, and everybody thought it's working. But the German were trying very hard to make as much money of the ghetto as they could, mm. and decided to leave 750 people behind in order... Out of how many? 
seven out of uh, 230,000 originally <laughs> was there. So the chances were slim. Yeah, very time. slim. And as I said, because my brother <coughs> was working for the German, we were one of those chose to be left behind. My mother, my brother, and myself. Mm. And our task was to clean the ghetto completely after all these people have gone, not there anymore. So it's to go into empty flats and houses and collect all the things from these flats and put them all outside in the street, separately blankets and bedding and furniture <coughs> and crockery and so forth. And then lorries used to come and everything went to Germany. At that time, and then we had to live somewhere, we had to be somewhere. So a camp has been formed mm -hmm. called Yakuba 18. That's where the camp was. Men and women were separately. It was a, a disused factory where mm. we lived. I. And my mother, we had a bed to ourselves with a little table with some utensils. So the factory was your house, was it? Yes, with yes. Other and, uh, the and we stayed in this Yakuba 18 club uh, camp mm -hmm. every day. The camp was run by Hans Bibov, and he was in charge of the camp with another man called Schwind. And every day, six o'clock, they used to come and count everybody and send out to work. Right. Okay? And I was given a task of cleaning the offices of this man, Bibov, and all the other officials that still worked in the ghetto. Right, yeah. Because all these things had to be registered, had to be sent to Germany, mm. and so on. So they had a, a small number of um, German uh, officials. But I could not be seen by them. So the office, hours, my working hours were like very early in the morning or very late at night. Right. So it was like 6 a.m. or 10 a.m. at night. And I had to light fires, clean floors, and um, <coughs> clean toilets, everything that was asked me to do. And uh, we were quite friendly at that time, me and my brother and other people that were involved in this working for the German and their offices, um, with the driver of Bibov, because he used to get drunk a lot. And when he used to get drunk, he used to come to the camp. And it was nothing for him uh, to shoot a few people and cemetery and so on. So and we, because we were friendly with the driver, we knew when he was due to go to the camp. So we could warn the people to stay indoor and don't come out and, and so on. So you're saying like a drunken game of yeah, this yeah, would be yeah. to go and shoot yeah, people Yeah, there's people. He was quite a rich man originally. He, had a, he came from Bremen. He had coffee uh, places and, but, he was a German, and um, like all German do, they, to kill a few Jews, it doesn't matter. And we were in this camp since September. The conditions were, as comes go, not too bad. Uh, we had rations, not very much, but we managed somehow. Mm. And we didn't know what's going to happen, but at that time, we knew that once this, our job is finished there, we will follow all the other people. Mm. Tell, me, tell me about the, his secretary and your relationship. Yeah, yeah, him. well, I'm trying to. And then we decided, we had quite a few doctors in the camp, mm. prominent doctors from Wuch, and we all had poison with us. So when the things come to the end, we knew what we're going to do. And during this period, I had a very unusual encounter with actually Bibov's secretary. Her name was Halina Schmidt. Mm. 
because one day as I cl when I cleaned her office, I found a letter addressed to me that she left food for me in her desk. And she said, I will try and bring every, all the food for you and help you as much as I can. And actually I've got a Jewish boyfriend who is in the camp with you and I love him very much. And he, she proved to be really a real, real friend because one day I found in the basket a gun and <laughs> that is, was quite frightening. I never had a gun in my life. Wow. Uh, with a note, well, I fear that the war may come to an end and you might use that. What does she mean by that? Well, she means by that that if, if I have to, I should use it. In what way? In what, kill somebody. A German, preferably, obviously. And um, <clears throat> we also, my brother and his friends, we also had a radio at that time, and we've realized that something is happening very, very quickly. So you've mentioned to me that a doctor yes, gave you a vial yes, of poison. Yes. Talk we to had, me about that. Whose idea was yeah, it? Yeah, well, we had How three doctors in the camp. Right. They were very eminent and well known in Watch before the war. And somehow or other, they managed to make, I don't know how or what, poison. And decided, we decide, all decided that we will all have the poison with us. And if we have to use it, we use it collectively, did all the, of did us. Did the thought of using it scare you or did it? Feel like no, it we at that time we were so uh, well. I don't. We we didn't think too much because it was every hour, every hour brought something else. Mm. And um, my cousin was with me in the camp with her husband. And one evening she said, "My husband's been working on a bunker. And tonight, be ready." because we're all going to that bunker that he prepared. Well, myself, my mother, my brother, together with maybe 10 other people, off we go in the night. Very cold winter, 13 degrees below zero. Was it no guards trying to stop you? No, it was inside the ghetto. Inside the okay. ghetto that bunker was, but it was <laughs> situated opposite criminal police, wow. German criminal police. So it was like a little um, plank. We didn't see anything. We went in there, this little room. We had no, we had very little food, just some dry food, some bread. We took Ida down with us and we just went into this little room, huggled together not knowing what's going to happen. At that time, I had a very nice boyfriend who was also in the camp, much older than me. And I said to him, look, I am now going with my family to this direction. We don't know what's going to happen, but should you be alive or should you, I will be more or less in this area. So look for me. We stayed in this place, maybe five, six days. No, no food, no nothing. We says huckled together with the eider down. Is it freezing down? There? Freezing, absolutely. Sometimes in the night, my brother very cautiously opened this plank to see what's happening. Mm. Quiet. We couldn't hear anything. We didn't see anything. Right under the, so the, the enemy's noses. Yeah, under the enemy's mm. noses. We didn't see. Well, we stayed there. And then one day, my, we had a lot of stamping over our heads, like boots. And then my mother said to me, I think I can hear some Russian spoken. Russian? She must be crazy. She must be, you know, delirious or something. Anyhow, my brother very, very cautiously opened this plank. And then I heard someone calling my name, which was my boyfriend. 
And then I came face to face with the Russian soldier. And he said, the war is finished and you are free. I can't describe that to me I, in that moment. That is, that is undescribable, particularly that the, the commandant of the group was actually a Jewish officer. What did you des describe? H how did you react there? Did you just be speechless? Did, uh, you, did you scream? Did you yeah, cry? I, I cried. I screamed. I did everything. <laughs> hug the, uh, hug I, the soldiers? Yeah. yeah oh, yes. Kiss them. Because I could never in my dreams believe that actually the German will lose and I will be the witness. Which that is interesting how at the beginning you were so yeah. sure that you'd be free and absolutely, the Germans would be defeated. Absolutely. And your optimism would turn uh, them in head. And then it was just, and then this Jewish commandant actually stayed, we were given a flat. The Polish government came straight away with the army and my father's friend again was working in the Polish government. So we were given a flat straight away in Łódź and this Russian commandant stayed with us because my mother spoke Russian and he said you are first Jews that I encountered since I left Moscow because Amazing. it was after Auschwitz Amazing. they were going very yeah. very quickly to Łódź and I was liberated in 24th of January and the war hasn't ended till May. Mm. And then it was, we started thinking of all our families and people, what happened to them. Some people who survived started coming to Wuch and we asked questions, have you seen this one, have you seen this one? And that is what I learned about my father, what happened to him, that my father volunteered to take all the children from my town and to be to look after them wherever they were going and they were all loaded in lorries and sent to a concentration camp which is not so well known called Helmno which is near Warsaw and they were gassed in these lorries, uh, they didn't have a chance even to get out. And I was told that when he left the, the plats in, in, in Pavianice with the children, they were all singing Hatikva, the Jewish national anthem. And because Very of powerful. that, I'm extremely proud of my father, of course. I feel that his uh, heroic action is, um, should be known to everyone. Absolutely. And uh, he was compared with, a, with another Polish well-known person. His name was Janusz Korczak, who was not Jewish. And when he was asked to leave Warsaw with orphanage, he went with the children together and, and with his assistant. It really is to most heroic. To Trevlinka concentration can do, camp, it? yes. So after the war, you testified against the Nazis. Yes. Describe that and how that made you feel. Well, uh, it was the first time in my life I was in a Polish court. Uh, but this, this Mr. Crump that I work for, I thought he was just a German employee. Hmm. It appeared that he was actually one of the main um, people who were in charge of a concentration camp in Helmno. And of course, when we heard that, I was going to testify. Mm. And um, when they asked him, you know, say a few words before he was executed, he said, oh yes, this Helena Hmura always said to me that she would like to do something for me in return because he was quite nice towards me and, well, as nice goes, I was working mm. for him. So I stood up and I said, well, I think I did. Wow. And, and yeah. 
testifying, how, how did that make you feel about, did, it, did you feel a sense of revenge? Well, in some way, maybe, but not much, not much. I suppose really. you can never really avenge no, what's no, happened to you. No, of course not, of course not. So what, I mean... But uh, it was very soon after the war and people were trying to revenge, people were trying to do all kinds of things. Mm. It was an uh, unusual situation because we were alive, but how do you start again in those mm. circumstances? When you testified, uh, you must have had a mm. sense of revenge, but yes, I suppose yeah. you can never really avenge what no, happened to you. No, no, it was, it was well, the people were not there, mm. the people that, I mean, my immediate family, maybe 35 people, uncle and cousins and aunts, and it's quite a big family. My mother had um, sort of eight or nine brothers and sisters. Mm. And what I want to say that, although we survived the war, we found that the Polish Christian um, people didn't like us to be there anymore, to come back and claim our houses or claim our properties because they already settled down. To reclaim, Every, claim. reclaim yeah. yes. And it was there, and uh, we realized the people that survive, Jewish people, that we are not, we cannot possibly stay in Poland anymore. And everyone tried to go away somewhere. Whoever had relations or way of going to America, to England, to Sweden, anywhere, and most of my friends, most of the people I was liberated with left Poland. And didn't, didn't, they, didn't the Christians in the town say to you, oh, you're Yes, they, they were sort of, when, when you Shock. met someone, they said, uh, oh, you, you were alive, you know, you sort of, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'm so right. pleased you're alive or something. We realized that it was anti-Semitism. And they, all these years, they managed without Jews. They thought to themselves, oh, well, we'll carry on. So you've mentioned the younger generations. What would be your message to well, each generation? Well, my message to younger generation is that, first of all, you must not be quiet if you see injustice in the world. You must stand out, you must stand up and say something if you see that happening. Also, not to judge anyone by the looks, by the color of their skin or their religion, because everyone is a person. And quite frankly, I don't believe there are bad people in this world. And we just have to tolerate each other and try to live in peace. And only by education we can achieve that. And by history, of course. And I hope that my testimony and will point out that we must not give in to people who just kill people for no reason at all. That's a very good message. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know how hard it is for you to talk about, but I think it's really important that you do, and I'm very proud of you, and I'm very happy to have been part of this Generation to Generation project. So thank you. Well, thank you too, darling. I'm so pleased that I was able to speak to you. <laughs> How does the, kind of the, the landscape today compare to when you first arrived in the country? 
Well, it is entirely different because first of all, when I arrived to this country, the immigration were controlled. You couldn't arrive without a special visa or someone who would guarantee that you stay in England and you are not a burden to the country. And I was not allowed to do any work. And uh, we couldn't just, you could, it was quite difficult to come here. Whereas now is uh, different. Everybody can come. who has got a EU passport because it's different. And in terms of, kind of culturally, do you, do you think there's a much more multicultural feel to society today? Or have attitudes, how, how much have attitudes changed, do you think? In the oh, world? yes, the attitudes have changed tremendously. I mean, when I arrived, there were mainly refugees from Germany, kinder transport, mm -hmm. or from Poland or Czechoslovakia. But now, I mean, the people in England, and especially in London, is so cosmopolitan. I don't know how many languages one one here, <laughs> 50 or more, and they're very, very cosmopolitan, and, and everyone loves being in England and being here. I, I certainly agree with that, yeah, particularly around where I live. It's, uh, it's a lot of uh, racial diversity yes. in different cultures and different yes. groups of people. And um, so one of the things that you've been very active of in the last few years is, is helping to share your experiences with children and at school yes. and kind of helping to educate them about what went on in, in Poland in the 1940s. Do you think children today are able to understand that, comprehend that, uh, of what took place there? Well, it, it is very difficult for anyone to understand it. And even myself, when I watch films about which ghetto, it's difficult for me to understand that I was actually there and witnessing everything. So um, when I speak to the children, I try to sort of uh, p sort of put the picture, paint the picture, uh, not too harsh, and try for them to understand that the, the idea is to be tolerant and to uh, not to judge people by the religion or their color and to stand up to hatred because there are some people in this world who just want to kill people for no reason at all and I hope that when I speak to children it is much better uh, for them to understand what happened there than just to read a, a passage in a history book because they do remember my visit Anyhow, they say so to me. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly puts, it puts a kind of a human face to the yes, discussion, doesn't yes, it? Which you can yeah, never really get absolutely. From, from reading a book. Yeah. And as you mentioned, because you're, you're doing these, these kind of talks on a regular basis, yeah. what else can we do as, as a kind of a younger generation to help ensure that these experiences are not forgotten and passed on down to future generations? Well, I mean, the, the project like this, Generation to Generation, I think it's extremely important because that will go to schools and people will actually see uh, survivors, real people who experience all that. So I think it is very important for future generation to be able to see us and uh, I hope, remember and learn. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, thank you very much Danny. Thank you interested. darling, thank you so much. I'd love to see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.